that I would ultimately become head of brand for arguably the most influential, coolest brand on earth. Sometimes you can't dream that big or that far. Anything where you have to ask permission to use your imagination, I don't want to be a part of. That's how you build a world-class brand team. Before we dive in, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. Greg, what is a brand according to Nike? A brand is not only something that is a branded product, right? But a brand, at least from a Nike standpoint and my standpoint, is something that creates an impression in one's mind that's both positive and empowering. And I think that's what the Nike brand has done over the years. It's more than a product, right? It's a state of mind. It's a way you can lead your life. And I think Nike through, whether it's Just Do It, whether it's the swoosh, I think Nike's a symbol of empowerment. And do you see brand in exactly the same way that Nike do, or do you have a slightly different take on what brand is? Having spent uh, 27 years there, I think it goes hand in hand with Nike's uh, point of view and philosophy towards brand. Uh, at the end of the day, um, there are transactional brands and there are relationship brands, and Nike is one that's forged a relationship um, with its customers, and it's done that through emotion, hence emotion by design. Uh, and um, how have they done that? Maybe that's something we'll talk about, but I believe it's been through a clear investment in the art side of branding. Because branding is an art and a science, but you could argue right now um, the art's being squeezed out of it, right? Um, as we have Do you all- you mean with, sorry to jump in, with Nike or with brand brands. in general? In, in, in general, I think as we have so many different technologies and platforms available, right? To learn more about consumers, to be more productive with our marketing, um, that's been great. Uh, at the same time, consumer engagement, uh, if you ask me, um, has become less personal maybe less innovative. Um, and so some aspects of this book is a call to arms, right? Um, and to ask the question of businesses small and large, does art have a seat at the table, right? Back to branding is an art and a science. And that's my question. And I think um, I give kind of a, a guide of how art, through your creative disciplines, how you tell stories, how you create a brand identity, the, how you create immersive experiences, whether they're digital or physical, um, do, do those practices thrive within your business? Or are you only focused on the science, machine learning, data and analytics on that? So it's, it's a balance. It's not either or, right? But um, you have to you have to commit, you have to make those choices. And first and foremost, you have to get far enough away from your own business to see it. And so I always go back to that question, is does art have a seat at the table when you're building a brand? Well, I think we should explore that. Um, but you referenced your book, Emotion by Design, which I've been listening to while doing my workouts. Um, I've been listening to on 1.8 speed so oh. this is going to be a nice and relaxed yeah. interview. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, what is emotion by design? It, well, one, it's a celebration of the power of creativity. But in terms of practice, emotion by design is when you commit within your brand, your, your business organization, again, whether you're a small or large business, to creative types, creative teams, and cultivating a culture of creativity because it's those disciplines, whether it's advertising, whether it's uh, brand design, uh, whether it's digital marketing, um, those are the disciplines that are oftentimes responsible for creating the emotional bonds between your brand and your audience, right? And so this is the practice of accelerating and deepening those relationships um, with your customers. Why is emotion so important in brand? Because without emotion, it's hard to move people. It's hard to instill confidence in them that they can achieve great things in your product. Oftentimes, without emotion, it simply becomes 
again, a transaction. Uh, back to this idea of art and science, you can also look at it as uh, a successful brand um, engages in both a rational and an emotional way. Rational being, it's like we've created a, a product for you, it functions well, um, and um, you're gonna be more productive with this service or product. Uh, but the emotional needs you may have, it's like, how does it make you feel when you put that shoe on, when you drink that type of coffee, um, when you get into this type of car? Not how do you feel about the brand, how do you feel about yourself when the brand provides this type of product and your ability to achieve um, your best? To me, that's, that's the difference. And you have to do both, right? Um, a big part of branding is creating that image of your brand uh, in the mind of the consumer. Check. You must do that on a daily basis. And it's, you know, that place is earned, not given. Like, you don't achieve something and then the next day you get to take a playoff. There's, there's no plays off uh, when it comes to, to marketing. Um, but to me, the difference between, uh, you know, a great brand and a good brand is a great brand is always the ask, asking the question of, of how do you feel um, when you interact with our brand to achieve what you want to do. You, you talked about listening to the book, uh, the audio book, you know, and I would ask, okay, so was the workout better or worse, you know? I want to know that. I, I'm less concerned what you think about me, more concerned with what does it allow you to do better than you did the day before. If you can make that pivot, again, even if it's a small startup, if you start with that mindset early on, I think you can grow a healthier brand. I'd like to talk about your 27 year rising through the ranks of Nike in a moment, but I don't want to miss out on something you said. Could you pick a brand that's not Nike or brands that you feel make us feel the most? Well, I, it's, it's an it's a often used example, but I think Apple is a master at this, right? They've created these incredible utilities, right? The iPhone, the iMac, iTunes, etc. They've created this whole ecosystem. And so even the form design, um, it you know, goes well beyond just purpose. They're beautiful objects. But the biggest, I think, breakthrough that Apple made long ago right? Um, and, and even how they brought those products to market is it was about what you could do with those products and what you could achieve ultimately. They always led with, you know, it's like, um, think different. Just as an example, it's like, that's a proposition. That's like, join this movement. That's, that's what they lead with versus here's our new technology. Again, that's the difference between good and great, great brands. I think great brands lead with a call to action. Um, Apple invites you to be a part of something bigger than yourself, right? And collectively be a part of this kind of creative revolution, if you will. Mm. And just as Nike does as well. And there's other brands like you could say Tesla. Um, you know, join, join, a, uh, join a brand that's building sus sustainable um, automobiles, right, that have a positive impact on the world, and they drive great, and they use this technology. But the ingredients come, they're tertiary, right? I think brands that lead with the, the, new, the new tech and are talking about the, 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 the how versus where we're going and how we're going to get there are the brands maybe that aren't seizing the opportunity um, that we have. So this is a question for later, but I'm going to bring it forward because you talking about Apple made me think of Steve Jobs and you talking about Tesla made me think of Elon Musk. But I don't know the founder of Samsung and I don't know the founder of Toyota. Mm. So is there something in this link between the personal and business brand? And did Steve Jobs and Elon Musk create this movement merging a business and a personal brand? I believe they did, yeah, and I believe it's quite powerful when you have a founder that every day not only speaks his vision but lives it, right?
right? And tweaks it every day. <laughs> yeah. and, of, and of course, evolves it because yeah. your initial vision is 1.0, mm. just like your iPhone, you know, 1.0 iPhone. Mm. So you have the right to continue to, to evolve that. And I, I would just say this, it's not just that the founder sets the tone and the vision and, and lives it through their values. Um, those brands are very, very clear, just like Nike with every single employee in the company is, is ab absolute clarity on what your belief is and why you exist, what your mission and vision is, back to where are we going and how are we gonna get there, and finally, what the core values are. There's no confusion, right? And yet, why is it if you went out, just even in this neighborhood and asked, uh, even whether it's established brands or startups, if they have that on a single sheet of paper, oftentimes they wouldn't be able to, to give you that. And that means there might be some confusion because you can't be confused internally. Um, if you're gonna create a transcendent brand, a brand that goes well beyond your products and plays a bigger role in culture, um, I believe that it starts with, with absolute clarity on, on your mission and, and your promise to the world and to the audience that you serve. Um, hard to be successful if that isn't clear. So when, I, when I'm advising startups, you know, um, established brands, or even students, that's, that's what I start with. You gotta master the fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with building your brand house and clearly articulating those, those uh, building blocks of your brand. Um, is it the most fun? Is it the most sexy? I think it is, but oftentimes I think brands are either under pressure if you're a startup to complete that product and start monetizing it, and you end up skipping some of the fundamentals on that. That's why I love the quote by um, the late great fashion designer, Alexander McQueen. You got it? Okay, that, what, I didn't know that. Mm. But it, you know, you gotta know the rules before you break them. Mm. And you're talking about an individual who broke all of them, but here he's saying, you must know the rules. And in branding, you don't get to skip that part. Mm. And yet, oftentimes, that's what you see, and it's easy to lose your way um, if you haven't clearly established that. Mm. So what is Nike's brand promise? To serve athletes. If you have a body, you're an athlete. And its mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete. And there's an asterisk next to athlete, which <laughs> is, all of us, if you have a body, you're an athlete. So that's, that's a pretty big mm. consumer base around the world because it's inclusive. It includes everybody. Mm. I'm going to remember that when I look in the mirror every morning. Oh, I'm an athlete there, there you when go. I get on the scales. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's true. I mean, and, and that goes for, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I think you could argue that Apple sees everyone as being creative, right? That everyone has creative capacity, mm. even if you can't draw, right? Because creativity really is about um, the inception of an idea and the application. Mm. And of course, application is about people with the deep fluency um, and experience or education to do that. Architects, graphic designers, UX designers. But the conceiving ideas, we can all do that, right? And if you go get into the all of us, it becomes quite powerful mm -hmm. versus only a select few. And so I'm very much of just trying to find that, that kind of uh, insight that um, unlocks your innovation or even your inspiration to a broader audience versus kind of maybe you started uh, with a very narrow kind of you know, image of your consumer in mind. 27 years at Nike's a long time and you built your way all the way up the ranks. Can you, um, on two times speed, take us on that journey? <laughs> yeah, no, you're, it, it's uh, two times speed. Okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, as someone who's not a fast talker. You know? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I had two passions in life, art and sport, and I thought I was going to have to pick between the two. And the fact that I was, you know, you're talking about a brand um, that defined the art of marketing, right? And so to come to get an internship right out of college at Nike and make that 27 hour drive from the middle of America over to Portland, Oregon to start that, uh, 
start that journey um, as a graphic design intern, right? Um, and um, was was just a, a just a part chance, part luck, and part you know plan for it, right? Because um, just through through my passion for sport uh, and and art, art of storytelling and brand building. And so over time, um, I started to get more and more responsibility. And it wasn't long before um, the very people I interned for, I was now having to manage, right? Uh, seven years in, you're now managing a team, right? Um, so that was, uh, gets back to that idea of even if you're not ready for it, um, you're allowed to learn on the fly. You're allowed to, that idea of failure um, leads to success down the road versus failure's failure, which you know is not a culture I would like to be a part of, and certainly one that isn't doesn't create disruptive ideas kind of thing. So, and then just to accelerate over time, I literally uh, started to get more responsibility, and they started giving me more oversight over other uh, functions and. Over time, I started to lead all of the functions responsible for storytelling, responsible for brand identity, and the physical and digital relationships Nike had with consumers. So think of advertising, digital marketing, um, brand design, retail and event marketing. So uh, it really got down to literally, I used to call it the starting 11, you know, these 11 brand functions uh, and oftentimes look to football for inspiration on how best to create football. collaboration. Let's just quickly talk about football. Do you That's mean right. American football or soccer? Soccer. Okay, so when yeah. you say football. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just gotta get that clear. Hey, I know my, when I'm in the UK, yeah, yeah. I am not saying Cause, soccer, cause, okay? Because American football, <laughs> they use their hand and they throw an egg. That's so wouldn't right. it, yeah, but football, you use a yeah. foot and kick a ball, yeah? Just, well, there, <laughs> is, there is place kicking in American football, right, yeah. okay, so. Um, when everything's on the line and time's running out, you got to kick that field goal. So, but I played, I guess one side note on that journey, I played football my whole life. Yeah. So when I got to Nike, um, Nike was just starting that journey. Had a couple big players, but mm. only a couple players in Nike football boots. Paulo Maldini, the great Brazilian Romario, to name a couple. Andy Muller, who was a German mm. Borussia Dortmund player, but that's about it. And I noticed no one wanted to work on football. So when I got there, even as this young kid, I was like, raise my hand. And they, they obliged, you're doing all the football work. So marketing and design work. So whether it was you know, creating posters, building store displays, you know, creating all the way down to hang tags, it's packaging, I did it all. And the first breakthrough was the, the 1994 World Cup. Uh, on that, which sound, I'm dating myself, but I think it's important maybe for listeners to know that that you know you're talking about a very small business to to go all the way and become the leading number one football brand. Mm. Um, pretty much in less than 12 years shows the commitment um, that the brand had and the opportunity that I had. You know, I consider that a privilege. In any event, yes. So I, I oversaw for many years these these the face and voice of, of Nike, right? Globally, um, and and over an uh, ever changing landscape of platforms, right? Because let's let's face it. I mean, YouTube really didn't get going until about two thousand and five. Instagram, as we know it today, that was like twenty twelve. And so my career arc. Um, at Nike really followed uh, the, the induction of all these incredible ways you could engage with consumers. And so um, back to this, uh, these two traits that I think the best sports teams have, speed and agility. I believe marketing teams, um, small or large companies, have to embody those traits. Um, and so that allowed us, by instilling and practicing with speed and agility, we were able to move from television, billboard, and print to a, a full-off offense that took advantage of all these new capabilities, right? And that ultimately led to the position of chief marketing officer. And had you told me when I walked in the door as a graphic designer who designed logos, right? Really intimate, personal 
like work that I would ultimately become head of brand for arguably the most influential, coolest brand on earth, like I had no idea, mm. right? Yeah. You, sometimes you can't dream that big or that far, but mm. one should. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right, there is at least six questions for me around my head. Definitely want to talk about Alexander McQueen, my yeah. favorite brand mm. ever. Um, definitely want a bit of brand advice for me from you while we've got here, sure. you here flying in all the way from America. But I listened to your entire um, book, Emotion by Design, um, and it was in, you had a very, at times, intimate relationships with, I believe, people like Ronaldo, you know, the original Ronaldo yeah. and um, some of these sports. And then I also think I'm a big golf fan. Yes. And actually, Nike's venture into golf, especially the club range, sort of a bit of a failure. They, they exited mm. golf club so why was Nike so successful in football, soccer, but didn't quite cut it maybe in golf equipment? What was the difference? Yeah, I would argue though, if you think about it, starting at not zero, but um, very low awareness in golf and through the relationship with Tiger Woods and introducing the type of not only footwear and apparel, but again, golf ball technology and even the golf clubs and Tiger winning all those majors within it. You look at Nike's growth in golf um, from where it was in the 80s until you know Tiger wins um, the four consecutive open or uh, majors uh, is quite astounding. So I always look as a, as a fellow golfer, I always look at, and we won't talk about skill level, Okay, um, we can do that offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but that won't be I, much of a competition. No, but I, I think I, what I would say is Nike, one of Nike's biggest um, contributions to the game of golf is its partnership with Tiger and what Tiger did to the complexion of the game and all the young and old golfers that never saw themselves in that sport, right? You're talking about a very elitist sport, very inclusive to kind of break that down and all of a sudden bring all these new people into to golf um, is extraordinary. And that, um, I believe, part of that is through Nike's incredible branding and storytelling prowess um, because it, it takes a team mm. um, to, to do that. And, um, just, and, and then with, with football, I think that just the commitment um, to, to innovation and, and bringing um, new, uh, not only technology, but um, demystifying uh, some of these breakthroughs and, and creating a game that was faster, more explosive, and um, more spontaneity, uh, have more spontaneity. And, you know, signing the Brazil national team in 1997, and, you know, I got to be part of this, this you know, event program called um, the Brazil World Tour, which was quite extraordinary at the time. We're gonna take Brazil on the road around the world and showcase brilliant football, this amazing, beautiful game that Brazil played. Um, and why, why, do I, why has Brazil been an inspiration to me as a team in terms of how I've tried to look at my own teams? This is because not only have they won five World Cups, but it's a team that's been allowed, the individuals on that team have been allowed to, you know, to, their personalities are allowed to thrive. The individuality that exists with each player, oftentimes in most teams, you need uniformity. We want precision, we want control uh, for 90 minutes. With Brazil, there's still structure there, um, but just like in the arena of innovation, you need individuals to bring their experiences and expertise and perspective into that, uh, that field of play. And so even though Brazil can drive you a little bit crazy as you watch them, there's gonna be one or two moments of brilliance that you've never seen before, right? And oftentimes it leads to a goal. And that's, to me, the process of innovation. Oftentimes, there's, there may be failure and failure, but then there's a breakthrough because you've created an environment where people are allowed, allowed to be themselves. Um, you incentivize that risk, 
right? Versus you take it away. Anything where you have to ask permission to use your imagination, I don't want to be a part of. So the teams I led, yes, we have very rigorous schedules, right? You're talking about a big global brand. That's a lot to deliver. Um, at the same time, I wanted people to understand that this was an environment that while we're doing our work, there's also going to be room for you to draw on what you see in the world and your own experiences. And I want you to exercise your imagination. And if you look at, again, not to keep going on this Brazil national team thing, but I, I would ask your listeners to just take a look at some of the, 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 the great teams and, and players. You, you mentioned Ronaldo um, is full, full stop confidence to, to express yourself, right? And I can't say that about you know, a lot of the football teams over the years, right? Uh, on that, so Man United, Man United, and Man United. <laughs> <laughs> well, the amazing. As a teams. Liverpool fan, I can oh, just enjoy okay. it at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Right. A random question popped into my head: Would you rather be the best or do it the best? So, Seve Ballesteros maybe mm. was not the best golfer that ever lived, but he probably did it the best. Ayrton Senna, maybe not as good as Michael Schumacher, but Ayrton probably did it the best. So would you rather be the best or do it the best? I think it's do it the best. I think it's relatability. Uh, often with Seve, people could see themselves. Everyone in, loved in him. him. Everyone loved him. Right. Yeah. And it's not only getting out of all these difficult circumstances and somehow he could play these shots that no one else could do, but there's a relatability of people saying, well, I've been in that same situation. Mm. Um, and so I think that's how you become... Um, it's really hard to become a transcendent brand if people can't relate to you. Um, I often think about, even though this is, you know, arguably the greatest, not only the greatest basketball player, but the greatest sportsman potentially of all time, Michael Jordan. And it also, he's also with the, 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 within my favorite ad of all time. Now, this came before me in terms of advertising, but, you know, the Michael Jordan failure commercial where he talked about, I've missed 9,000 shots. 26 times I've been asked to take the game-winning shot, and I've missed. And it's by failing and failing again, that is why I succeed. And so, and that's something we can all relate for. We can't dunk a basketball, I can't. You, you probably I still can't. Can. Okay. <laughs> I can't on my son's yeah. new one. I just showed <laughs> him I could that's do right. that. Yeah, he's 11. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think, you know, sometimes we have to point that out to people mm. that despite how heroic and otherworldly the talent is with these individuals, oftentimes it's a brand's job um, to reveal some vulnerability, to reveal uh, some relatability. Um, and I think that's what Nike has done a great job, even with Tiger Woods. And so, you know, you mentioned Senna and, and the humanity, the human behind the superhero, whether it's through interviews, whether it's through commercials, what have you, um, always comes through, right, on that. Um, and I think that that's, goes beyond being the best, right? Because I think we're obsessed with the best. Um, I know I've fallen into that trap over the years versus the most empowering, the most personal. Um, those are, I think, especially for startups, it's just, just avoid the mission statement that says you want to be the biggest or you want to be the most successful or you want to be, uh, make the most money. Those, th all three of those should be an outcome of a great brand strategy, right? Versus you're chasing these statistics and you haven't, you haven't done the other work. Um, to figure out who you want to be and where you want to take people, right? Mm. Um, it's quite, quite powerful if, if you say, I want to take people on a movement, whatever that is, right? I think for Nike football, it was, you know, a, a movement, you know, find your fast, a movement of speed that's never been seen before in the game. Like, okay, I want, I want to be a part of that. Like, who are the players of this this superhero team, you know, and back to the original Ronaldo. I mean, the guy was like 
That, that level of explosive speed hadn't been seen before, Cristiano Ronaldo. Mm. So, but, but asking yourself, yeah, what, what's, what's this um, movement I'm gonna take people on? Um, and how is my product gonna be a tool of empowerment on that journey? Um, I like these big questions. I think they open up um, a bigger opportunity. Uh, and um, I think it's best to ask those questions, uh, you know, during the initial phase of a, a business versus after it's already been established. Mm. Do you think to be a great artist, you have to have experiences with your demons and go through much pain? It's a, a great question and one I think that's been asked uh, a, a lot over the years. I'm sure my... Not on the Disruptors podcast, yeah. I don't think, yeah. I'm sure my wife has asked that about me. Like, <laughs> meaning, you know, because it's true. Do you have to experience adversity to... Well, look at all these people we talk about. Of Most of them have, and very publicly. Tiger Woods, very publicly. Anton Senna died because of it. Seve Ballesteros probably died because of it. You know, some of the great artists of... Uh, yeah. Kurt Cobain died for it. Deep. I think, I think it, to me, it's more about being inquisitive and being curious. And I think those traits and characteristics, first and foremost, um, are usually dominant. Like the ability to look outside yourself and constantly be searching for inspiration. It's really hard to be creative yeah. if you're only sitting in your business sector and you're never looking beyond it. Because innovation, more often than not, um, comes through transference. It comes through uh, things happening in other sectors that you pull into your area of business. Mm. It just does. Like, look at Nike Air. Nike Air um, came from space exploration. You know, a NASA engineer um, was working on something for astronaut helmets, and he comes to Nike, and it leads to Nike Air, the greatest revolution in footwear cushioning. That's just one example. Um, I remember taking the team to um, Savile Row and we went in and kind of watched uh, a lot of these uh, tailors that had been doing this for decades. And we said, what if we followed this model and created uh, sneaker customization studios? Well, that would be pretty amazing. What do you know? We've got hundreds of these studios in a couple years. Just because we stepped out, we had natural curiosity. Um, we were inquisitive, we sought out inspiration, and we pulled that back into the world of sports and delivered disruptive concepts. So I don't think, yeah, I don't think um, it has to be a negative. And by the way, I think you can train yourself to be more curious. We're not all, all naturally curious. I think you can give yourself essentially homework or plans. You know, I'm not just here, you know, if I come to London, and I just keep it all in my head, all the people I met, like yourself, the things I saw, um, trends I was feeling, and then I just went back to the States and didn't tell anybody about it, well, then, then uh, that's bad on me, right? I think uh, it's not only being curious and finding inspiration, it's sharing it with your teams. Mm. That's how you build a world-class um, brand team. Um, where the sharing, not only the finding of information, but the sharing of that happens on the daily. And I think that's a good learning uh, for your listeners, is to make sure that there's a culture of curiosity, because that resides in a lot of the individuals you just talked about, um, and that that has uh, a, it's prioritized, and it has a place within the culture. Right, because business culture matters when it comes to creating both innovation and business growth. Um, so, um, can curiosity be a dominant trait within your team? And it's not just for creative people; it's left and right brain thinkers, right? A hundred percent. I might have just had a bit of an epiphany in our conversation. I want to come back to it though, because I never thought. Because I asked you about if great artists have to face their demons and go through much pain, and then you talked about curiosity, but I'll come back to it. First off, in your book, you talk about Kobe curiosity. 
So do you think you've maybe learned some curiosity from Kobe? No question. I mean, uh, and I think anyone that worked with him in the creative capacity greatly misses him because um, an innovation or a new idea is only as strong as the insight that, or the truth that you start with, right? So that means you have to spend the time to truly undersolve to truly understand what's the problem you're trying to solve and to be able to work with an athlete who came to every meeting with so much inspiration and insight to the point where oftentimes he was educating us. You know, I talk about this story of this is when today we all know augmented reality, right? And oftentimes you're in a restaurant and you scan the QR code and you get your menu, etc. We're all familiar with that now. But imagine when it was just starting and here's this athlete going for his fifth NBA championship and you show up as the marketing team and Kobe's on the other side and you should be essentially bringing the latest brand technology and platform developments into the meeting about how it's going to enhance his brand. And here he is educating you on augmented reality or anything else or how he sees his style of play manifested in different metaphors, whether from the animal kingdom or the world of technology, you name it. Um, so what, what I drew from, from Kobe was just how important curiosity is and being, it gets thrown around a lot, but being a lifelong learner. And here was an individual who obviously was just amazing on the court and, and gave people so much inspiration through his style of play and known for this deep commitment to the craft. But at the same time, how much time he spent outside of that um, looking into emerging technology, art, entertainment, storytelling, that's quite powerful. And I think you wanna surround yourself with individuals like that um, or find people to bring into your life as a business person um, who push you. Um, because if you're the only one that is constantly, you know, out there looking at what's happening in the world, um, that's a heavy burden to carry. And so it's like within your team or the ambassadors that you work with, who are those individuals that are constantly going to be bringing the future to you? And Kobe was one of those individuals for, for the marketing and design teams. How did you feel when you found out the news about Kobe? It was devastating. You know, um, and there's obviously so much um, that he gave the world, right? But devastated for, for obviously his family. Um, and um, just to think about what he had already in a short time, just since his retirement brought to the world and what he would have continued to do. But, you know, his legacy um, is so strong um, that, uh, and so much of that is due to his commitment beyond the game. And that gets back to that idea of being, for a business to be more than a product, um, to stand for things greater um, than the business itself um, on that. So back to this possible epiphany, this could go completely wrong and I could be talking up to shit. So definitely take a sip yeah. of your water. But um, I love art and I don't really talk about it much on my podcast because it's something quite personal to me, but I'm always fascinated with artists, whether it's sport, music, fashion, and it does seem that some of the great memorable artists do struggle with their pain, and it does seem that the public tend to love them if that pain is part of the journey because we all experience pain. And you said about curiosity maybe being a trait of great artists. And I wonder if that's why so many people struggle who are great artists with pain, because surely the more curious you are and the more you learn about the world and life, the more you realize you know nothing and there are no answers. Mm. And then you take drugs and then that just opens up the world to looking for solutions, but you have more questions than answers. What do you think about that? That was a moment I just had here with you. What yeah, you well, I, look, I, I think there's... Uh, I, I do think living in the now is sometimes hard for artists, right? Even for me, right? I'm always in the pursuit of what could be, right? Versus what is in the, in the moment. And when you are on that search, right? 
and where you are certainly in the design world, this pursuit of perfection, which is not possible, right? Um, it's like Nike's original uh, slogan was, there is no finish line. Long before just do it, there is no finish line. That couldn't be more true, mm. right? Um, the best, because you could argue the best track and field athletes are never satisfied, mm. right? And not being satisfied can be um, corrosive, mm. right? So I think, um, do you have, you need individuals in your life that aren't just enabling that pursuit of something that, quite frankly, may not be possible. Um, people to ground you, people to keep you in reality. Um, just speaking from an artistic sense. Um, and, and so you're right. Sometimes we only celebrate tragedy, um, certainly over the years, in, in kind of the, 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 the story around some of these, these great artists. Um, um, but not all, I guess, are, are in that kind of uh, arena, mentally, if you will. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I do think it, it, you, you, you raise a good point. And um, I guess what I, I take from it as I get, you know, on in years, if you will, <laughs> is I'm trying to do a much better job of, of staying in the moment, right? Of, of I'm a daydreamer. And if, if it, and it can be dangerous, right? Mm. If you're, if you're only, if you're not present. And so, um, and then there's others that like, you know, uh, have that great ability to never be looking back or forward. They're just there. Mm. Um, and uh, so I think we all have um, aspects of our persona that we can work on, mm. right? Um, but um, my hope, I, I think to this point you're making is, I, my hope though would be that we see less and less of those extreme struggles because um, there's lo less and less stigma attached um, to mental uh, mm. struggles. Mm. Um, and um, again, early stages, but you're seeing much more openness around that, especially with men, right? It's just not something even five years ago you would talk about, right? Because it's about winning and being the best and showing strength mm. and never showing vulnerability. But think about what I just said about the best advertising, um, certainly that I've been associated with, shows a multi-dimensional human being. You know, your, your brand personality is a mosaic. I think it's really important, and this goes for your audience who are just starting to create new businesses, is to make sure you're expressing all the traits of your brand at, at different times, not just one that you think you know, society wants to see, right? Mm. We're in a period of time now where um, I think, uh, you know, it's really important to show some of the other characteristics that we as humans have, but through your brand as well on that. So epiphany, yes, but it, there's a lot of truth in, in what you said, but I think we're, we're, we're entering a new era, I think, mm. where there's gonna be my hope would be there's less fascination with um, what people are, have gone through and more about how can we help people without you know, not feeling like that is what leads to creative excellence, mm. certainly in the art world or the fashion world. Mm. Mm. What do you think made Nike one of, if not the biggest brands in the world? Again, I think it comes down to emotion, making people feel. Right. I know that's how I was drawn to the brand as an, a teenager. It wasn't necessarily through the product that my, my classmates had that I couldn't have. Um, it was more through um, their brand voice and what they said and how that made me feel inside. Um, and, you know, it's a hell of a thing when someone talks to you in a way where you can't wait to get to the gym. Right? You can't wait to get to the court or the track. Um, that's just like a car company. You can't wait to jump in that car to take that drive um, or watches, how that makes you feel um, throughout the day to be wearing that. So those go beyond. Nike early on went beyond um, just kind of 
uh, serving a functional benefit. Like back to that idea of, of stirring emotions uh, in the deepest way. What are those emotions? Like what are the emotions you get owning a pair of Nikes? I think part of it is- Sorry, Nikes. It's okay, I, I know. Yeah, I've done the, I yeah. just mocked you for football yeah. and I've just done the complete yeah. opposite. <laughs> That's right, I think, well, and, and in this, I have to say in the 70s, early 80s, people, even in the States said Nike, mm. right? The E took, took, took a while yeah. to, catch, to catch on, but um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's self-belief. Right. Instilling self-belief um, and, and, and belief in, it, in achieving what you, you didn't think you could achieve before. Um, and that's back to that idea of empowerment. Mm. Um, and um, just back to my first pair of Air Force One highs, you know, when I was a freshman in high school, you know, you lace those on. What is the feeling you get? You actually, you know, you have a higher opinion of your level of athleticism and play than reality. Mm. And that's okay, mm. right, I, in most circumstances. Um, and um, just like if you were, so it's not just you're playing the same golf ball as Tiger Woods. Um, it's, it's the belief in your head that you're gonna hit that, you're gonna strike that golf ball better than you, you would the day before. That's, that's the, the, the feeling you get and that's the role brands can play and, and not just in business, but also rallying around some of the most pressing issues that we have around the world mm. uh, today. Um, and if we're to, to, to move, move this world forward in a more positive way, it, brands will need to play a role. Well, that was one of my questions actually, how much of a role should brand, brands play in important topical cultural issues? Well, I, again, I, I personally don't think indifference is an option with brands, especially with their employees. You know, your employees want to know where you stand because they see the images and feel these things every day. And even if that risks alienating customers. Well, um, having an internal conversation and asking questions and using certain filters to decide if it's the right time and, and uh, issue and platform for you is really important. It doesn't mean there's no mandate or thing that says you need to respond, right? Um, but I think a couple things. The first thing you have to, again, I talked about is make it be extremely clear what your mission, vision, and values are. Like um, before you could um, move a conversation in a positive way around an issue of today, you first have to make sure your house is in order. Secondly, you have to figure out, can you connect what you sell with what the world needs on a particular issue? And, and how do you close that distance? If you can't do that, it's probably not the right time or place for you to say anything as a brand. Now, if it's very connected, the, th the third filter to, to go through is, okay, well, how do I make sure what we say as a brand or provide is through, um, through why we exist? Like if you're a sport brand, you must speak through the lens of sport. Um, if you're an auto brand, that's the lens you have to speak through because oftentimes you might see a commercial and it's clear whoever created this commercial um, has something to say about a particular cause, but you're, you're not quite sure who it is. And then at the end, you see that logo. And you're like, huh. Well, you need to make sure the connection is really clear again. You know, what you sell what, with what the world needs. You can't get distracted from the business at hand. But with that said, now more than ever, I believe that your employees, your customers, especially young customers, and even your shareholders expect an integration of you know, driving business growth, brand strength, and social impact. Um, it's not an initiative, right? If, if you've clearly articulated your values and what you believe, then that should be a part of your natural kind of daily approach to business, right? But it really comes down to making sure you have a forum to ask those questions, right? So that um, when you do decide to speak or give something to the world, 
to kind of move things forward in a positive way, that it feels right, it feels connected, um, and it will resonate in a deeper way um, than, than, than not, than coming across either tone deaf or it's confusing. So um, you can avoid that by, again, um, having those conversations. But I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's, um, it has to be a business distraction. I really think it can be a business enhancer, actually. Okay, thank you. What's the difference between brand and marketing? Well, marketing are the, the practices and activities to create your brand image, um, to create your brand impression, which is branding, right? Does that make sense? Mm. So if you look at the definition of brand, because believe me, as a branding ex instructor, right out of the gates, first class, it's like, what is a brand? If you look at the definition, it's quite simple. It's a product that's been branded with a name. You're now officially gone from a commodity, which is a faceless, nameless product, to a brand. So you've, you've, indicated, some, uh, you've indicated a distinction with a name. So if we talk about just 30,000 feet, that's what a, a branding is or branding is. Marketing are the activities to instill again that image, that impression in the mind of the consumer um, and start to build that equity uh, you know, within the marketplace in the world uh, for, for your brand. Easier said than done. Mm. Um, but that's why I say it's an art and a science. And in the science side, there are very deliberate, deliberate methods that you're going to take to build awareness. Awareness doesn't, believe, doesn't mean that anyone has any affinity for who you are. All it means is you're, you're getting your, your name out there, you know, and so um, you've created the awareness. Then people can start to recognize who you are. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean um, they have an opinion one way or the other. They just know you're in the business. So that would be kind of the, the differences uh, that, that I would see. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say differences. I would just say um, they one one leads to the other. Yeah. So I've thought quite a lot over the last fifteen years of being an entrepreneur. What is a brand? And I've got a new theory. So can I test it on you sure. for the first open public time? Okay. A brand is being clear on who you want to piss off. Mm. What do you think about that? Well, I, I I don't think being in the middle is ever a good idea, right? And um, one, I think you can piss people off, but you can bring people with you at the same time, right? So um, I would say that's... Or who you're prepared to piss off. Maybe not who you want to piss off, but who you're prepared to piss off. Yeah, you're not going to be for everyone. Um, at least in terms of if, if you're being sharp in terms of what you're delivering in the world. Um, and... Oftentimes, people aren't going to necessarily be in agreement with that. With that said, I would just say, I don't think it's a, if we just look at, you know, the competition, if you will. So part of great branding, great marketing is understanding the competitors in your sector. But there's a difference between being obsessed with them and following them or being defensive with your strategy versus being aware and understanding, but focused on what you need to do, right? And, um, you know, and if you piss off their consumers because you're taking the category someplace new with your products and services, so be it um, on that. But yeah, I, I just believe that you can't, um, uh, if you're looking to create mass ac accessibility, with your brand and your messaging all the time. And things feel very um, neutral in what you say and do. Um, it's hard to stand out. It's hard to be, back to the name of your podcast, disruptive, mm. right? Um, disruption uh, in terms of, of a lot of the innovations, certainly in, in retail that we brought to market that were very new um, 
you know, we're not about serving uh, the now. It was about putting something out there that, that could be polarizing, mm. um, but at the same time was rooted in serving needs better. Because at the end of the day, we can talk about, you know, um, this idea of pissing people off, but at the end of the day, to me, like you should always like, are you making people's lives better? Are you reducing the friction and inconvenience that um, resides within the way people live or not? So to me, that, that full stop, you, you have to be coming to work every day, figuring out how you're gonna improve uh, people's lives. And, and then within that, how you package that and deliver that can be quite um, revolutionary and maybe even a bit polarizing because you need to get people's attention. Mm. That's why I use that example of, of Ronaldo, uh, the original Ronaldo showing up to the 2002 World Cup with his head shaved, but he had a, like a triangle of hair in the front. People are like, what? People didn't like that, a lot of people. Yeah. He knew exactly what he was doing. Mm. It's like, and he won the golden boot with that haircut. Yeah. So that's why I talk about style without distinction is, is just sometimes forgotten, just like performance without style can be mm. forgotten. But when you bring those two things together, you can get incredible distinction. And it might start off as not being for everybody mm. or people not getting it or feeling, you know, but over time, as long as, again, the underpinning here is high performance. Like without that, it really doesn't matter what we're talking about. And believe me, I love art for art's sake, right? But if we're in the business of um, creativity to serve our business, then it has to solve a problem and deliver high performance. Mm. And then um, everything falls off of that. I think the reason I've come to that realization is because I've been a people pleaser since I was about nine or 10 years old. I was the fattest kid in my year at school for about three years straight. And that caused a lot of angst for me where I felt like I was ostracized, I was an outsider. Um, some physical bullying, but mostly mental, and more of that in my own head than in reality. So I built these coping mechanisms just to basically get through being a, a person growing up, getting all these hormones, becoming you know a teenager and a man. And so what I learned is to make everyone my friend so I could be included. And it was, that helped me cope as a kid. And that was the worst conditioning to be mm. an entrepreneur because yeah. I've found if you're a people pleaser and you avoid conflict all the time and you're a yes man and you just sort of, you, you're not really concerned about truth, you're concerned about di non-disagreement, yeah. that's actually the worst trait to be an entrepreneur. Um, and so I had to then go on a 15 year journey of unlearning mm. that mm -hmm. and you know, like purposefully creating conflict. Yeah, I can relate. Uh, which I found yeah. really hard. And then I'm really fascinated by Bill Gates Donald Trump, etc., and so many people hate these men. And I'm like, why am I so fascinated with people that so many people hate? And my son said to me, Bill Gates is one of the most famous people in the world. And I thought, no, he's not, because he's older. And the younger generation, nah, Dua Lipa, whoever, nah, 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 Bill Gates, and, and we Googled yeah. it. And Bill Gates, and Donald Trump is the most famous person in the world, and Bill Gates is right up in the top 10. And though m billions of people hate Bill Gates, and billions of people hate Donald Trump, so this whole journey is, here we are, I'm sure. telling you about maybe a, a, a powerful brand is being clear who you want to piss off. What do you think about that? Give me a bit of therapy on Well, the reason years. I can relate to a lot of what you're saying is I was an outsider too, right? I, I grew up in the middle of America. I'm mixed race. I'm half black, half white. I was adopted. I grew up in a white family, in a white school system. You can imagine in the late 70s, early 80s, the level of racism mm. I dealt with on the daily, right? Mm. So my coping mechanism, of course, was to try to fit in, keep, keep, keep it quiet, right? To, to, to try to be included, if you will. Now, with that said, art, and, art was the escape from that reality because I could create my own 
you know, future, if you will, right? And people took notice of that, um, as well as sport is the great equalizer, okay? It kind of levels the playing field. So I can under completely understand what happens when you're in those environments early on in your life, um, and those chips start stacking up, that you can go two ways. You can fold, or you can use that as fuel. And it sounds like we both used it, uh, took a while, but use that as, as fuel. And I believe, and I think I see this in you, is you know, while I was an outsider, I was also looking at other outsiders, people who weren't part of the norm, um, people who often, like do myself. Do you relate to them more? Yes. Yeah, I do. I never, yeah. Because you're the only one like yourself in the room. Um, whether it's body type, race, gender, whatever it is, um, whenever you're spending large portions of your life as the only person in the room like you, um, you tend to create, you, you tend to develop more empathy, right? And you notice communities and individuals that don't have access. And that's why I spent so much time how do you bring your innovation and inspiration to more people that have barriers to get to it, right? And never allow some of the things you experience to happen to others. And thank God we live in a different world now, mm. right? I know my kids, I'm so happy they were able to grow up in a different environment mm. than I did. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 so I can relate to, to, to that part. And um, if you look at what Bill Gates has done, you know, I just came from the TED conference, um, in the global one in Vancouver, where he spoke, you know, and um, how much he commits his resources and time to, to trying to cure the world of some of the most pressing ailments and illnesses that certainly plague the most depressed economies and people mm. in the world. Yeah, he's hated by billions for it. Well, well, if you look, if you yeah. read social media, no, that, years, well, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I, 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 again, it can be. I think, and we'll see what history says, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm. I can also see. Um, it gets back to maybe some of the earlier conversations we had in terms of what people want to focus on, or what makes headlines or sells, mm -hmm. and then what maybe reality is. And I just look at uh, an individual's commitment to make the, the world better. Mm. Um, because if you don't have that, um, this is gonna be a pretty short road for us. Mm. I mean, I really believe that, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So we can talk about marketing and innovation and business and stuff, but if we don't have a, a world <laughs> to pursue Very that, true. Yeah. Is it really, does it really matter? Um, mm. And um, so, but, yeah, thanks for sharing that that insight and that story because I can I, I'm I'm there with you, man. Mm. Like that, I live that. Yeah, and, and then that brings us to that's why I think that who understanding who you're prepared to piss off is a thirty five year journey of me to accept the fact that if I'm truly authentic and expressing who I am by nature, you attract the opposite people who will be pissed off with you and hate you for who you are. You know, I have a, I have a, I've got an outdoor gym and mm. I've put some quotes on it. And one of them is, people will hate about you what's great about you. So you sometimes hold in your greatness or your uniqueness for fear of being judged. But you'll be judged anyway. So why not just show the world who you really are? Because if you're going to get judged anyway, yeah. like I teach people how to be wealthy. And people are so scared of being judged by be, for being rich, but you get judged sure. for being poor. Yeah. So you might as well be rich. But I've gone on this whole journey of, well, because everyone talks about express oneself, be authentic. What does that really mean though? And I still think it might mean accepting and being clear who you want to piss off. I do, and, but, but I would also say even as we're both on this. By the way, I'm not trying to teach you about brand. You're teaching me about no, brand. We're both I'm just on, discussing yeah, we're something. both on this growth journey. I mean, we're we're you know maybe in different times in our lives, etc. But you know, um, you're you're creating you're creating access and accessibility to to um, financial educate. You know, it's like you've created your invitation. I just think if anything. Sometimes maybe people are only seeing the headlines, right? Mm. Um, that are 
statistically based in terms of your own success and, and, and need to hear more about how you're creating success for everyone by sharing your knowledge and your, your expert network, right? Um, it's hard to criticize that. It's back to that idea of breaking down barriers. Um, but I think here's what, you're not one trait. We're, we're just like a brand, a human being is multiple traits and, and it's just important for us to ensure that we're exercising those and that, you know, we're, um, we're celebrating business success and achieving these, these, thresh, these thresholds, right? Mm. At the same time, we're also talking about um, how do we create more financial security for, for everyone? And I think, you know what? Then at the end of the day, if people are mad about that and you've pissed them off, so be it. Because as long as, you know, there's a part of, that's why I bring up um, everything that Bill Gates is doing with that wealth. And at the end of the day, he can sleep at night because he's, he's, um, he's using his platform to affect, you know, lives and certainly um, improve situations in these really depressed areas of the world. So it's just, it's just making sure that um, people get the full story and then at the end of the world, because like I said, it's like oftentimes the, the business success is an outcome of a great brand strategy. And it just so happens that having an impact in society is an important part of one's brand strategy today as a leader, as a person, and as a brand. Are you up for doing a quick fire round? I think so. <laughs> so your, your challenge, hey look, you love winning, so you can, you can be great at this. Um, Cause I, I mean, we could be here all day, um, Greg, with all of these questions I picked out of your book. Um, but you know, you're not just here for me. Um, so, 15 seconds or less is the challenge for each answer, if you're ready. Oh man, you've done, <laughs> I'm not the best at these, but um, back to the perfection thing. We'll get there, we'll get there. Where did Just Do It come from? Uh, Dan Wyden, the co-founder of Wyden and Kennedy, came up with that as he was watching TV. And there was actually a, 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 a convicted uh, felon who was, who was facing um, the electric chair. And he, he said something to the effect, this individual that was facing the chair said, you know, something to the effect of, uh, let's do this. And that's the epiphany of this. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Just do it. No, I didn't, that's, that's fucking awesome that is. I'll just asterisk that one. <laughs> that's, a, that's a TikTok there. Um, what makes great marketing? Uh, deep understanding of the individuals that you serve as a brand, right? And serving those needs uh, through storytelling, through experiences, um, through services. Uh, so great marketing serves a purpose. Um, it improves people's lives through your products, through your services, etc. How'd you create great stories? Again, it comes back to, in my opinion, empathy and curiosity. Empathy is you're trying to find the deep truth that you want to reveal. So you have to spend time peeling back the layers to get to that insight. And then you reveal that through the points of inspiration that you find in terms of what type of voice you want to use. But it comes back to spending the time to get to the root of the insight, past observations and assumptions. What's the Derek Redmond moment? Incredible. Derek, uh, part of the Barcelona Olympics, pulled his hamstring, I believe. He was a sprinter. His father came out of the stands, got onto the track, had a just do it hat on, draped Derek's arm around his shoulder, and proceeded to help and carry Derek across the finish line. If you can't feel in that moment, you need to check your pulse. And that, that is uh, the ultimate just do it moment. 
What's a visual journal and why keep one? Uh, don't just keep curiosity in your head or don't, don't just find things that captivate you. Um, make sure you either write those down, take a picture of them, take a screen grab of an article or a quote you like and get them into um, some sort of journal that's somewhat organized and give access to that journal to your team so you all share in that inspiration. I think it's really important. It leads to, it will, all it takes is one of those instances to spark um, an innovation. Why is passion a risk-taking emotion? Passion is so important in, in the process of innovation because at the end of the day, if you don't have passion and the consumer doesn't feel your passion, they'll go find someone else who's got it. And so I don't look at it as a risk. I look at it as a prerequisite to being a successful brand. What do you think of Facebook's rebrand to Meta? I understand <laughs> why. I understand the why. Um, I think history will, will tell us how successful the how was in terms of the word and the brand identity, right? Um, so I understand why the pivot, um, but I, I, it, it remains to be seen. I'm just going to call you out on this. Greg, Go that was it. the most political answer. Your face did not match your words. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm, allowed, I'm allowed one of those I, during this podcast, yeah, right? You're, you're allowed to do whatever you want, but so am I. <laughs> so what do, what do you really think of Facebook's rebrand to Meta? I just think Meta is, is such a big word. I mean, the metaverse, you're talking about rebranding something with... I, I would have liked to see something maybe even sharper, right? Versus saying, using a word that really is, um, you know, the entire environment, half of our, you know, future is gonna be spent, you could argue, we'll see, in the metaverse. And so to occupy that, to, to state claim to that word and use that as to, to brand Facebook, um, uh, is very broad in my opinion. So just as, a, as someone who, who spends a lot of time on naming and naming innovation, that's my observation. Getting there, right? <laughs> so, still political. We'll turn the cameras yeah, off for the, yeah, like, the third one. <laughs> we're, we're, working, <laughs> we're working down the... <laughs> um, in his career, how much do you reckon Tiger Woods got paid by Nike? I, you can you can do the math on that. I don't know, and you worked at night. I, I I'm not gonna get into statistics. Do you and, and do you dollars. know though, or were you not part of to that? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know. But if you were like, to guess beyond what you could find at Google, right on, on Google, yeah, right. Oh, you wouldn't know. What, what no, I wasn't. Search. I was. I do you reckon a billion? I didn't oversee, but it's it's obviously it's clear over his lifetime with all of his. Uh, you know, uh, dimensions of his brand, um, he clearly is in that vicinity, mm. regardless of just Nike or not, like that. Yeah. Wow. And that's a testament to his, um, not only his talent, but what he means to the, the, to the business itself and to just the people, mm. right? What do you think was Nike's best ever campaign? Well, I named one specific ad which you know was really important to me the the jordan failure commercial um as far as the most rewarding one i worked on which was the largest at that time actually was during the 2012 london olympics which was the find your greatness campaign um, which i had the privilege of helping to lead that that whole idea of greatness isn't a birthright you're not born with it like we all have it within us it's just up to us to define what greatness is and then go out and get it. And the fact that we took a moment when everyone was focused on the elite athletes and instead turned to the 25 different towns throughout the world that are called London 
and brought to life the individuals that lived in those towns and the sports and the Olympics that they were participating in. So to me, that's the definition of just do it. What's the worst Nike campaign ever? There are no worst Nike campaigns. What's the biggest right? failure Nike campaign? I would just say that the times where I failed as a leader in leading anything is when I, did, I tended to not listen. Um, you have to listen before you lead. If there's one mantra I would throw out there. And when I, yeah, so when you self-author something and you don't involve your team, generally it's not going to be as strong as it would be if you involved everybody, right? So whether it's a campaign, whether it's a, um, a vision that you've, you're, you're creating or the mission statement, all those things, you've, you've, you've got to involve your team. The times I didn't involve my team, the, the work was weaker. What's the best question a brand can ask? What, what are you promising the consumer? What's the brand promise? That's one. Two, where are you taking them? What are you asking them to do? A answer those questions. They're big questions. And if you can define that, it will unlock much bigger business and revenue opportunities. Does the product sell itself? Absolutely not. <laughs> you can do the other 13 <laughs> seconds if <Yeah>. you want. <laughs> No, I think... Because uh, people say that, don't they? The, the, the biggest sales should be only available. The product sells itself. I think there should be inherent benefits um, that can be seen and felt and heard without marketing per se, right? Some of the best products, you don't even need a logo to understand who the company is that produced it. Um, with that said, back to this idea of emotion um, and creating relationships, it's hard to do that if a product's just sitting on a virtual or physical shelf mm. and it's up to the user or the audience to figure out, you know, um, what the bigger uh, potential is in that relationship with that brand if there's no story with it. Mm. So I'm a big believer in the power of brand story, not content. Okay. What mm. is content? We know what a brand story is. So from a mindset standpoint, this is again for your listeners, I prefer instead of saying content all the time because that can um, lack a respect for the craft that it takes to create something. Like um, we, you know, we need the brand story tomorrow is different than we need content for the tomorrow. Uh, saying uh, we want to share our brand story is different than saying we want to distribute content. One's quite mechanical, one's very human and personal. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Ah, uh, being on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going super easy on you, Greg. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just joking. Yeah. I'm uh, basically like, this is like a vacation for you. This is just yeah, the yeah, easiest yeah. one you'll do. No, I think, <laughs> look, man, I, I hey, I, I was a, uh, you could say I was an introverted artist who, who came into a highly competitive uh, corporate environment. And um, there's a, an incredible amount of risk. That. That's why a lot of uh, artists, if you will, don't necessarily gravitate to the world of, of business, right? Because there's inherent risks in that. So, um, so yeah, I would say that, that that was a risk, but it's one that paid off um, in a lot of ways and was allowed to grow. I, I think we need um, opportunities to grow. If we have to prove it like in the instant, that's a hell of a thing. Um, and most likely then you're not going to attract some of the best talent in the world, right? Um, that's why I say in the, in, in the book, you know, it's like... Um, Embrace the daydreamers, the quiet voices, and the diverse ones, because more, more often than not, um, they're the ones that, you know, don't necessarily get that shot, right? And therefore, you're losing out. I, I can tell 
tell the listeners, right? Um, if you're only going with the loudest voices, uh, only going with those that think in a linear way, um, and and on that, it's it's you 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 may not find the most innovative solutions on that. So Ronaldo, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, who is the best brand ambassador Nike have ever had? I just I just know in terms of interacting uh, with with an athlete, I think. Um, Kobe Bryant was just amazing in those moments as a creative partner, right? Um, but I was lucky to be able to work on athlete brands of so many iconic athletes, all of which you could lay claim to being not only the greatest athlete within their particular category, but truly in the world, right? And it's in some ways a silly, um, uh, Question. Yeah. <laughs> no, but just argument, right? When you compare athletes between sports and generations, it's like, is Muhammad Ali better mm. than Mike Tyson is better than Floyd Mayweather? It's like, it's really difficult to uh, mm. do that. I think every player has, an ap has their apex moment where they're at their the top of their game and it's an incredible thing and it just so happens I got to experience so many of those like Roger Federer, uh, Rafa Nadal, Serena Williams just to, just from a tennis standpoint to get to work on their brands uh, in one generation is, in, is incredible right um, and I'm just I'm just talking about one sport mm. uh, on that so and not to mention they're amazing human beings I mean, that, that's, what, that's what I learned from, from a lot of these athletes is you can achieve. Um, and I've learned that as a leader too. It took me a while. Mm. Is you don't have to create a miserable environment for your team to achieve excellence. Mm. That, and I think that's the expectation now in the workplace, that excellence can be achieved while also enjoying um, the moment and the journey uh, as a collective. Mm. It doesn't have to be a, this embrace the grind, but you can be inspired and enlightened on the way. Mm. And maybe previous generations to us, it wasn't always the case. Um, mm. Like, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna be brutal, but we're gonna win. Mm. No, I don't think anyone signs up for that now. Mm. I really don't. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have inferior products and teams and athletes anymore. It doesn't actually, it, it proves the, the opposite, mm. so. So you mentioned the Williams sisters randomly, but of the moment, do you think Will Smith's slap at the Oscars maybe hurt their brand and their legacy? No, I don't. I think that's, that's what they've done um, is in my opinion one of the greatest stories not just in sports but just in general mm. um, to come from um, where they came from to break into a very exclusive uh, sport and then to dominate it the way they did together uh, is just uh, in incredible and nothing can take away from that and um, again uh, I, I, I I truly believe that. This podcast is called Disruptors. We evolved the name of Disruptors from Disruptive Entrepreneur. Um, what does the word disruptive mean to you? Coming, for me, it means coming into uh, an arena, whether you're an individual, whether you're a brand or you're a product, and completely define what's conventional disrupting the status quo, right? And um, I think it's, it doesn't always, disrupting the status quo doesn't always mean it's gonna lead to success, but I do believe, if you believe in this idea of um, success coming from failure, um, uh, as I've pointed out a few times, um, I think you can, you can truly achieve that um, on a more consistent basis. Um, you need some wins, you need some success early on, but uh, that's what I would say. It's like 
Um, so even from a, a, as a leader or a captain, if you will, um, it's, it's, it's coming in and, you know, um, bringing in a different mindset, um, a different um, value system um, that's going to turn things upside down uh, in the moment. But oftentimes things that have been disruptive, as you see today, are, are the norm now. It's just at the time they seemed uh, like way out of left field mm. on that. So, um, and quite frankly, uh, we used to have this conversation about, um, you know, when I was leading brand communication and we would talk about what are the traits of Nike's brand personality that we want to express during the year. And oftentimes someone would say provocative as one of the traits. And what we always got back to is it's like, no, that's for someone else, that's for the audience to decide. To set out to be pro provocative is, is, would be a distraction. Just like if you set out to be cool or you set out- Well, I fail at that straight away. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, those are, again, those are all going to be decided by your audience. You mm. know, your job is to authentically solve a problem in a dis and that's the disruption you create. Right. That's what's provocative. That's what's cool. Mm. You don't start out with saying, I'm going to create something that's disruptive, provocative, and cool. Because then you're chasing, mm. right? Your job is to be authentic to who you are and truly solve something with deep purpose that creates some sort of, it's the benefit that's disruptive, right? Yeah. Because if the if it's not beneficial, it's like, how is it disruptive? No. Your book, Emotion by Design. So I've had it on at the gym, listened to the whole thing, really enjoyed it. Love hearing all the stories. There's lots of stories in the book, which of course you believe in storytelling. So can you tell us a bit about your book? Please shamelessly plug it, um, because I have listened to it and I'm a fan yeah. of the book. I think that that's really important to say. Emotion by Design. Yes. Uh, so emotion by design. Uh, first and foremost, celebration of the power of creativity, right? In business. And in this case, um, me being part of that power of creativity through 27 years at Nike from an intern to a CMO. Um, but it really illustrates the lessons and practical principles for anyone, an individual or a team or a business, large or small, what happens when you commit to the creative practice within your business and cultivate a culture where creative teams, right brain thinkers um, can thrive and how that commitment to creativity in your business is what leads to the strong emotional bonds that your customers have with your brand, which ultimately is what leads to business growth. So, Creativity, emotional connections, business growth and brand strength. And ultimately, how I close the book is how all that will allow you to play a greater role in society. When you've achieved that status in people's lives, when you've resonated that deeply in, into um, not only um, your audience, but in culture, um, it gives you new opportunities to play a broader role in the world. And um, I think it's quite timely right now as well. I want to say I really enjoyed this. I think yeah, we've probably gone 14 hours yeah. over your time <laughs> slot. So you've got to clear your diary for the day. I've now, now gone back to uh, West Coast time in the US. Yeah. So Yeah, but, uh, so you're your publicist here. So she's probably done you hour, 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 yeah. hour, hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, right. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate Cheers. it. All right. Thank you. You bet.